Okay, now there are a lot of videos showing how to install <clears throat> a Viking engine in aircraft. Um, this is the, the 90 horsepower, and uh, you know, this is actually being now tested with a small turbo to see if we can reliably make a 100 horsepower engine, but that's besides the point of this video. It just happens to be on this engine. Um, <clears throat> we're gonna show the installation of the 90 horsepower engine in a 701 airframe. And we're only gonna cover the things that are different because uh, everything as far as, uh, you know, your fuel system and your electrical wiring and all that is all the same as on the, on the 130 engine. So go to those videos, uh, and there's plenty of them uh, for the 750 Zenith and the 601 uh, and the 650 Zenith. They're all the same for the fuel and for the electrical. Um, one thing that's a little bit different is like the, just on the engine and it's the placement of the sensors for your, um, for your uh, Viking view instrument on the engine block and a little bit different as far as how to mount the radiator <clears throat> and, um, and maybe a few other small changes or differences uh, uh, as far as mounting things to the engine and the engine mounting. But we'll cover those one at a time and then anything that's not mentioned here um, will be in the other existing videos, including the wire diagram for the engine on the installation page of the website. Okay, let's just cover the radiator installation. Of course, uh, some ingenuity by the builder, you know, preferences and stuff of how you want things done is <clears throat> totally up to you. But here's, here's how we did it. Um, and all radiators are not exactly the same. This is a prototype that we had, and uh, and the ones that are being shipped out now are very similar, but now maybe not 100% identical. As you can say, you see there are studs, uh, and these are then uh, uh, six millimeter by 1.0 millimeter studs. So they get threaded into the radiator in uh, uh, three or four different locations. Should be four. They might not always be lining up with the preferred places on the airplane but you have to just shift the radiator around enough that you're happy with the layout so that when you get on the inside of the airplane the bolts uh, and the nuts end up in uh, proper locations and then you know when you put a, a, a air box on it like we had the luxury of being able to weld it to the radiator but um, and that was done as the prototype but normally it's done the other way around you you make the air box and you make little channels on, on the airplane uh, and you put the air box on the airplane. But that's explained in the 750 videos, how to make the air box. And then it goes all the way around. And of course you have to notch it here and there to make sure that you capture as much of the air as you can. And then when the air gets in there and comes out here, it cools it. And we'll talk about the uh, hoses and everything and the layout of that. Let's take a look at the the nuts on the inside. So you're basically gonna come up through the floor and uh, put a little fender washer and the nuts on there. Um, and then you can put nuts underneath also. And that'll hold the whole thing in place. You can use nylon lock nuts or just a drop of blue Loctite. Let's take a look at the hoses and the routing of the hoses coming up to the engine. So as you can see, the radiator Kind of stops at the end of the airframe there, uh, over the firewall. And then this first one is a 90, and it comes across to the other side. And then we have a 45. There's a tube here with a welded in 45, then another 90, and then up to the cylinder head of the end. Okay, it's a lot easier to see here. You can see this, a very professionally made stainless steel um, welded assembly for the thermostat housing and that's what you're going to be hooking up that first hose to going down to one side of the radiator. Now the other side is very easy um, and again uh, there's a picture on the website that shows a slightly different layout for our newer style radiator but the principle is the same. Uh, coming up here and then into the thermostat housing right there. Okay, overflow tank. 
the hose goes here underneath the manifold and uh, eventually you're just going to route it so that it gets to the bottom of your coolant tank keep that like about half level and make sure that it is below the inlet of the cap here because if it's not then when you remove this cap eventually it'll overflow here you don't want that so you want the engine to push and draw coolant from a bottle that's just a little bit lower like here and expect during the first few starts and it gets to operating temperature that this will draw coolant and it'll get lower and lower and just keep filling it each time until it stabilizes at the half mark or below okay so now as far as the coolant we've always used the Evans uh, coolant which will come in your fireball forward kit uh, I would run the prep fluid ahead uh, just put the gallon in that would be your first fluid that you're going to put in and run the engine for a little while at idle on the ground that absorbs any moisture that's in the engine then you drain that from the bottom radiator plug and then uh, you put the high performance waterless engine coolant in and put a sticker on the firewall close to the bottle that you can only use that you don't want any water after that in the engine the advantage the disadvantage with it is it doesn't cool quite as well it's not as good as water but other than that, it has all kinds of advantages. It uh, will um, help you not have any corrosion in the engine or in the radiator. Uh, it doesn't boil until it gets to like 375 degrees. Uh, if you have a tiny little leak, it's not gonna just uh, push out because there's very little pressure in the system. You can, we can run a four pound or five pound radiator cap instead of a 14 to 16 pound radiator cap. And well, that's why we use it. So we recommend you also use it. Uh, do the prep, put the coolant in, uh, buy a little extra coolant. Just one gallon is about what it takes, but if you have two gallons, you'll have for you know forever, whatever. You'll have to refill, and uh, if you drain it at times and you spill a little bit, you, you have a little extra. So that's what you use. And then make sure you place this somewhere in the, uh, close to the, um, where you would fill the coolant so nobody puts water in it water in it would actually make it uh, with low pressure cap the water would then boil at 212 degrees Fahrenheit or 100 Celsius and it would uh, push out through the cap the whole advantage of this is to have low pressure cooling system okay fuel is easy it's just like the 750 650 videos and you're just going to end up at this 90 degree that comes with the engine and that's a, a removable quick disconnect uh, fitting you squeeze this it'll pull off and then put a little o-ring grease and you can put it back on and the fuel hose ends up there and then of course just route it throughout the engine and along the bottom of the plane uh, without it chafing the engine mount's been worked on uh, for a while and this is not the absolute latest but it's close um, you're gonna basically uh, bolt it up here that would be the last thing actually you drill and bolt but it's going to have two quarter inch bolts into the frame of the airplane i would i would actually drill those last um, right here you will use quarter inch bolts some airplanes end up putting a little extra angle uh, around the corner for extra additional strength uh, might not be needed depending on how yours is set up uh, this engine mount is an earlier one that has a spacer here. Uh, your new one will not need a spacer. Uh, so basically, but what you do need is uh, the engine mount comes like this. The 701 requires a little piece of steel around the corner here uh, underneath. So what you do is you, you just bend up a piece of steel and it gets two screws underneath here and then this gets drilled through it and one screw there. You just check your plans. Sometimes this is welded to the engine mount. We don't do that because it's easier to have it as a separate piece. Uh, you can also put it on the inside of the plane. It doesn't really matter. You can make that piece uh, bend it and put the angle on the inside with two A and three screws here and then put this bolt through it here. It adds a lot of strength. The mount is then, well, the engine is bolted to the mount and this is what we call a cradle. And we'll go and look at that at uh, another airplane uh, where it's more clear or another engine okay here's the uh, cradle that's mounted to the engine it basically transforms the engine 
to an airplane engine, meaning that it can be mounted from the back. So it has a few attach points uh, on this side here. Then there's a bolt that goes into the engine here. And then on the other side, there's a bolt here. And then another one down here. And that's it. So now, as far as bolting it to the airplane, you're gonna be using one out of these three uh, attach points. So each, uh, the cradle comes with three height adjustments for mounting it to the engine. Uh, of course, the rubber damper uh, go in the uh, engine mount and then your bolts go through here. You're gonna have a fat washer on each side of the rubber dampers. Uh, here you just have to keep in mind a few things, the height of the engine, um, and just making sure that things don't kind of hit each other. Uh, this bolt probably will hit the one of the washers, but that's okay. Anything that, that hits something that's part of the bolt, like the washer, is okay if you just don't want it to transmit through the rubber any vibration into the engine. So keep that in mind when you mount it. Also, some places are gonna be a little bit tighter than others. Like for instance, down here, uh, you know, if you choose the top engine mount, it will be fairly close to the water pump. So you might have to use a, a flat uh, nut and a Loctite rather than a lock nut. So just keep all this stuff in mind while you're uh, installing the engine onto the airplane. But it's a straightforward procedure. It's not hard and uh, makes for a really easy and nice uh, attachment. Yeah, just a little more on, on the uh, engine mounts. So you've got your rubber dampers, a small washer, big washer, rubber damper, rubber damper, big washer. Now, right in here, if you want to add a couple of AN6 washers to get a little bit of more spacing to everything than you can. Uh, as you can see, we have a couple extra threads, so so that's that wouldn't hurt to have two AN washers in there. Now, on the other side, it's a little bit tighter because you've got this you've got this bolt right here. But like I was saying, uh, if it hits this this washer behind it, it's not going to cause vibration. It's only if it hits this. Uh, that you'd, you would have vibration. So keep an eye on that. And then uh, on the other side, on the bottom, we talked about the uh, clearance. Now this uses the middle mount, so it's got plenty of clearance for the water pump. If not, you can do like I said in there. Now when you level the engine at the end, you know, the engine is pretty flat up on here and it's 90 degrees to your prop. And you can put a, a smart level there and then on the back of the, on the airplane here, you can put a smart level up there. Uh, or in the door frame inside, like they specify in the plants. And that should be, uh, the engine should be then level or a degree down. Uh, plus minus a degree is fine. You just need to be able to clear the cowl. Okay, putting oil in the engine. So, very simple. Like, just like on a car. Uh, you know, make sure you got a good drain plug with a new gasket down there and then put four quarts of the synthetic 020 oil or 520 oil, either one will work on this engine, into here each time. The oil filter is uh, on top of your oil cooler. This part that sits in here is your oil cooler. And then uh, your filter is here. So you would replace it with uh, the same part number uh, each time you change the oil or any time you want, really. You can change the filter as often as you want. Your starter wiring is very simple. Uh, of course, you need a positive cable uh, routed down so it doesn't chafe on anything. And it goes to the back of the starter, like right here, and just snug that down. Not so tight that you break anything inside the starter. And then this guy uh, is what activates the starter. I usually put a high quality connector and I squeeze it a little extra and force it on there and then tie it off immediately so that it doesn't come off later on. And that cranks the starter when you put 12 volts to that. Alternator wiring, very simple. There's uh, one single wire from the center, from the back of the alternator. It just goes to a switch on the panel where you turn on five, I mean 12 volts to activate the output of the alternator. Just look at the wire diagram for the other engines. And and then, of course, at the output of the alternator, you have to run that to the battery. You can run it to the starter if you want, because the starter is uh, then connected to the battery. 
your ground cables. There's a provision on the engine for grounding bolts. It comes with the engine. So, you know, just ground here and ground here. Put a dual bat, dual grounds. Uh, you can run one to uh, the chassis of the airplane if you want. And then uh, run another one to your ground side of the battery and then one from there over to the other battery. Uh, sometimes we put the batteries out here. We also like to put them inside, which I prefer with the access through the uh, instrument panel. But those are options. As you can tell, we strain relieve the cables as they leave, so the vibration is not on the terminals. Okay, draining the oil, you do that right here. Uh, put a new gasket on each time. If you want to safety the drain plug, like on a traditional airplane engine, uh, I mean, it's simple, you can just drill a tiny little 16th inch hole in this aluminum bracket and one in the bolt and safety it if you'd like to do that. Don't torque these too much, just put a little bit of sealer on it in addition to the drain gasket and don't tighten it too much. It's a pressed steel oil pan like on, on cars and uh, they'll last a long time but they really don't handle uh, over torquing of the, of the drain nut. These are your coils for your cylinder one, two, and three. And underneath those, if you remove them, is where your spark plugs are down inside. And you can do an automotive style compression check once a year. Just remove the coils, the connectors, the coils, take the plugs out, get an automotive uh, compression tester, warm up the engine before you remove the parts, just slightly, not, not too hot, but just a little bit of warm up, a couple of minutes, uh, and then uh, put the tester in and crank the engine about five or 10 pulses and get your reading. Uh, right next to them are your fuel injectors, fuel injector one, two, and three, and that's what puts fuel into the cylinder, and that's what's called a fuel rail right next to it here. Over here is your uh, variable valve timing solenoid control, and the sprocket that does that is right inside of this housing here. You can see that rounded part. Your dipstick is, uh, if the airplane's sitting level, you can use it the way it is, and check your oil. If the airplane uh, it's a tail dragger or something. You might want to check your oil when the airplane is level or level it and then uh, remark the dipstick with a prick punch when, um, when it's sitting in normal attitude so you know what that would be. Here's the throttle cable. The throttle cable is a specific part number from Aircraft Spruce. It basically is a universal throttle cable with a 1032 uh, end on it. The end comes with the engine and um, you have to buy the cable, of course, the right length. Make sure that after you get it adjusted that you tighten these against each other here and here. Um, unfortunately, you have to use some vice grips there because there are no flats. Over here, it's very important that you get the right setting of this so that the throttle will operate full open, full closed. Your uh, set screw for the idle is right here. And you can run about 14 to 1600 on the idle with a warm engine with a propeller on it. Uh, this is important that this dimple that you see actually goes into the groove in the cable, otherwise it can slip out. And that's all there is to throttle cable installation. All right, we're putting together uh, some three cylinders here. The, uh, uh, these are easy to view because they're not all put together. Here, for instance, is the temperature probe for the Viking view. And uh, over here is the uh, pressure sensor. It's easy to put on ahead of time. That's why we recommend people buying the Viking view and just have us install the sensors as we go along. Because it just makes it a lot easier. So there's your pressure sensor. And uh, here we can see the injectors from below because there's no intake manifold. There's a cam sensor right here. There's that fuel piece we looked at earlier. The filler neck coolant temp for the uh, engine computer, for the Viking view, the exhaust ports are over here, and here's your drive coupling for your uh, uh, gearbox and your flywheel. Over here you can see it together. There's your fill plug for the gearbox. Uh, it has a nice sight glass. Of course you can just fill it half to, to almost full on this style with the 7590 gear oil and there's your starter mounting it's got two three eighths uh, or and six bolts in it and there's this oil cooler we talked about and the filter goes on here 
oil cooler just stays on the engine. The hoses for that go to your thermostat housing, which is this part right there. And another hose comes from up here, and they both then run through the cooler, pulls the oil. And uh, that's nice because you don't need an external oil cooler, to, and you don't have to mount it somewhere else on the engine. And your intake manifold. So that's pretty much it for this little engine. Um, we're gonna link to uh, the other engines as far as uh, how to install them since everything is very simple. I know I didn't mention what type of gear oil. Be sure to use the Mobile One uh, 75W90 gear oil. We, you can, you know, everybody has their preference on oil, but that's one that we've found that doesn't foam, and that's important in the gearbox. So just stay with what we what we know works on that one.